Hello everyone, welcome back. In this video, I wanna talk about discrete random variables. So let's go ahead and start with the definition of what we mean by a discrete random variable. So a discrete random variable is gonna be a variable that can only take on a countable number of values. So for us, the variables will be the outcomes of events that have just a finite number of possibilities. So let's go ahead and look at an example of one of these events and also introduce some notation that is very common when working with uh, discrete random variables. All right, so let's go ahead and look at our first example of a discrete random variable and also talk about this notation used with these. So in this notation, you're gonna see a big X as well as a little x. And here, the big X is gonna be defined as the number of heads when a fair coin is flipped three times. And little x is gonna be the numbers or the values zero, one, two, and three. In general, what we do with the big X in this notation is give a written description of the event. This little x is related, of course, to big X, but what the little x is actually doing is giving us the numbers associated with the different outcomes of our event. So big X is giving us a written description of our event, and in this example, our event is the number of heads that turn up when a fair coin is flipped three times, and little x is gonna be the numbers or values associated with the different outcomes. So our values are gonna be zero, one, two, and three, because we could have no heads show up in our three flips, or we could have one, two, or three heads show up in our three flips, right? There's no way to have four or more heads show up if we're just flipping the coin three times. And there's three things that we're gonna focus on and look for when we're working with these discrete random variables. We're gonna look at the probability of these different outcomes occurring. We're gonna look at the average or expected value we should run into if we run these uh, experiments a large number of times. And then we're also gonna talk about things like the variance or the standard deviation of these um, average outcomes. So the next term that I wanna introduce or define is a probability distribution function. And that's what we just use to kind of measure or describe the probabilities of these different uh, outcomes occurring. So a discrete probability function, or a PDF for short, is just describing the probability that the event x takes on the value of little x. So our probability distribution function for this example is gonna describe the different probabilities or likelihoods of these outcomes of flipping zero, one, two, or three heads when we flip a coin three times. A few other important characteristics of a probability distribution function is that each probability for an event must be between zero and one inclusive. So that means it can have a probability of zero happening or a probability of one happening. And also the sum of the probabilities has to add up to one. All right, so let's go ahead and figure out what the probability distribution function is gonna look like or be for this example and this event. All right, so here I'm setting up a table to organize our information and figure out what our probability distribution function is going to be when we're flipping a fair coin three times and we're looking for how many times the outcome is gonna be heads in those three flips. So we're gonna do a little side work to figure out the probabilities of these different outcomes. So we are flipping uh, three coins, so each coin is gonna be, or each coin flip is gonna be an independent event. On the first coin flip, there's two outcomes, and then on every coin flip, there's two outcomes. So in total, there's really eight different outcomes that we can have when we are flipping a coin three times. And so now we have to figure out what those eight different outcomes look like, and then figure out how many of those outcomes of the eight are gonna have zero, one, two, or three heads uh, in total. Okay, so let's just kind of start generating these and be careful and maybe systematic as we do so. So the first e, uh, outcome that could possibly happen is, well, we could have all three coin flips show up as heads, or we could have the first two coin flips show up as heads with the third one being tails, or we could have the first one being heads, the second flip being tails, and then the third one being heads, or we could also have the first one being heads, and the last two being tails. All right, so these are like half the possible outcomes. The other half are gonna start with that first flip being tails. So we could have, well, all three flips giving us tails, or we could have the first flip giving us tails, the second flip giving us heads, and that third flip giving us tails again, or we could have first flip tails, second flip tails, third flip heads, or let's see what's the last one gonna be. Well, we could have the first one be a tails and then the last two be heads. And so these are our eight different possible outcomes when we are flipping three coins and they can either land on their heads or their tails. 
Okay, and so now we can just assign from these different outcomes, which of these values do they correspond to x equals zero, one, two, or three. And remember here, little x is describing the number of times heads is showing up in our three coin flips. So when we have three heads, that's corresponding to x equals three. In the second situation, we have two heads, so that correspond to little x being equal to two. The third situation also has two heads showing up in our three flips, but in a different order. But that is still gonna be a case where little x is equal to two. And this uh, fourth one we have listed, that is when little x would be equal to one. All three tails means we have zero heads. So little x is zero. Then filling this out for the rest of them, we should have little x equals one, little x equals one again, and then another case where little x is equal to two. And with this, we can now figure out the probability of each one of these events occurring. We'll fill that out in our table, but just as an example, I've also seen this notation in use. Say we wanna know the probability when little x is equal to zero. So to figure out the probability of when little x is equaling to zero, we have to look at the ratio of when that event occurs or the number of times that event occurs to the total number of outcomes for the event. And so let's see, if we count up all the x's with zero, there's only one time this event can occur, and we have eight total outcomes. So the probability of little x being equal to zero, or zero heads coming out when a coin is flipped three times, is going to be one eighth, or 0 0.125. So when x is equal to zero, p of x equals zero is going to be one over eight. If we look at the next possible event, or the next outcome, when we have just one head flipped, Let's see, this case, this case, and this case. So there are three of our eight events. We'll have the outcome of just one head showing up in those three flips. Next up, we can count the number of times two heads show up in our three flips. One, two, three times. So that will also have a similar probability of three to eight, or three eighths, or 12.5%. And for the last situation, how many x equals three cases do we have? It looks like we just have one so the probability of uh, having three heads show up in our three rolls is gonna happen like one out of eight times. And so here we can see as we're creating our probability distribution function table that all the probabilities are between zero and one. And furthermore, if we create a little cumulative frequency column for these probabilities, we should find that they add up to one. And just quickly creating that little cumulative frequency column for our probabilities of X occurring, 1 8 plus 3 8 gives us 4 8 plus another 3 8 gives us 7 8 and plus that final 1 8 give plus that final 1 8 gives us 8 8 or 1 just like we were expecting so this is a probability distribution function for our event all right so now that we have a probability distribution function we can do lots of cool things with it one thing we're going to do often with our probability distribution functions is use them to compute and find the expected value so what is the expected value? The expected value of an event or an experiment is what the average value of the outcome approaches as the number of trials or repeats increases and becomes large. So if we do our three coin flips once, maybe we end up with no heads at all. But if we were to keep doing that coin flip three times, uh, hundreds of times or thousands of times, meaning each time we flip it three times, but if we were kind of finding the average throughout all those trials and repeats of our experiment, on average, how many heads are we getting? Well, that is gonna be the expected value of our experiment or event. It's essentially trying to describe what usually happens most of the time. All right, so our expected value is really just like our long-term mean or average of our discrete probability distribution function, and we can calculate and denote the expected value in the following way. So we're gonna use similar notation for the expected value as we were for the mean or average because, well, that's, that's what it's connected to. And so mu is representing the expected value of our discrete PDF. And the way we can calculate the expected value is we multiply the numerical value for each one of our outcomes with the probability of that outcome. And then we add all of those products up. So we're taking the sum of little x multiplied with its corresponding p of x or probability of little x occurring. All right, since we already have little x and the corresponding p of little x values in our probability distribution function table, we can create another column and multiply those numbers together to create this quantity x times p of x. And then adding up all the values in this column will give us our expected value. Okay, so let's see. 
for uh, the first case where little x is equal to zero, we're going to multiply zero and one eighth together, but that'll just give us zero. For the second uh, row in our x times p of x column, we have to multiply little x equals one with p of little x equals one being three eighths. And so that'll just multiply together to give us three over eight. And so in our third row, we have to multiply two and three eighths together. That'll give us six eighths or three fourths, but I feel like reducing these fractions really actually isn't helpful in these situations. So let's leave it as six over eight. And for the last row, x times p of x should multiply out and give us three over eight. And so now how do we find the expected value mu? Well, we just add up all these numbers in this uh, x times p of x column. That's what this notation is describing, right? Taking the sum of the x times p of x values, and we get zero plus three over eight, adding six over eight to that gives us nine over eight, and adding another three over eight to that gives us 12 over eight, or uh, 1.5, or three halves. So the expected value of this situation is 1.5 or three halves, which makes sense due to the symmetry of our outcomes. Right, we're flipping a, a coin uh, three times and we're trying to see how many times heads shows up. Most of the time, it's either one or two heads showing up. So on average, you know, 1.5 heads is what we should expect. And so the expected value is 1.5. That's not an actual possible outcome for our event. So we probably want to really interpret that as like, the most likely outcome is you know coming between one and two. And so we've calculated averages before, and when we were talking about calculating averages before, we also wanted to talk about the standard deviation to see you know, how many of the data values are close to the center or the mean or the average, or how are they spread out away from the mean or the average. And what we can calculate the um, standard deviation of one of our probability distribution functions in a very similar way that we did before. Okay, so the standard deviation of a discrete probability distribution function is still just a square root of the variance, and it's calculated in a pretty similar way. So we're going to denote this standard deviation using sigma again, and sigma is going to be defined as the square root of the sum of the products between the difference between the outcome, the little x value, and our expected value or average mu squared multiplied by the probability of little x occurring. All right, I think we have just enough space left in our table to try to compute the variance and the standard deviation of this situation. So in our last column over here, let's look at all these individual quantities or values for x minus mu squared multiplied by the probability of little x. So once we fill out this column, we're gonna have to use it similar to how we used the previous column. We're gonna add up all the values, but then we're also gonna have to take the square root of the sum of those values in order to get the standard deviation. If we just add up all the values and do not take the square root, well, then that gives us the variance, but the standard deviation is the square root of the variance. All right, so let's see what happens for this first row here. We have to do the little x value of zero minus our expected value or mu value of 12 over eight. We square that difference and then multiply it by the probability of little x occurring here. And this is the probability of one over eight. And so if we do our arithmetic here and simplify that, it should simplify to nine over 32. Okay, let's find this value for the next row in our table. So what is x minus mu gonna look like for the second row? Well, now little x is gonna be one. So that'll be one minus 12 over eight that gets squared. And we multiply that by the probability of little x being equal to one, and that's three over eight this time. Right, and so if we simplify this expression, one minus 12 over eight squared times three over eight, it should simplify to three over 32. So for our next column, our little x value changes to a two. We still subtract the mean average or expected value from that, square it, and multiply it by its probability of occurring, which is again, three over eight. And if we crank this out, we again get the value of three over 32. For this last entry, we have to do the little x value of three minus 12 over eight, square that, multiply it by its probability of one over eight. And if we simplify this expression by hand or using a calculator, we'll find this value of nine over 32 occurring one more time. All right, and so now if we wanna calculate our standard deviation, which is denoted by sigma, we add up all these values in this last uh, column. So that's nine over 32 plus three over 32 plus three over 32 plus nine over 32. 
let's give us 12, 15, 24 over 32. But if we just do the sum 24 over 32, that's not our standard deviation, that's actually our variance. To get our standard deviation, we have to take the square root of this. And if we wanted to simplify this, we could simplify this to the square root of three over four, which could further simplify to like the square root of three over two, or as a decimal, approximately 0 0.866.